Hello. Um, my pleasure to introduce our entertainment show this afternoon. Gino, Gino, Gino. Gino. Pecor is a storyteller, musician, dancer, freelance journalist, and a retired school teacher. He uses all his talents to bring frontier history alive to his audiences. Also known by his native name as Winter Elk, he holds a master's degree in theater arts interpretive performance from Eastern Michigan University. He has performed in New York, Ontario, Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois, as well as Ohio. And if you guys saw the video that the society did, he played Tecumseh and Etienne Brule, how do you say that? Uh, Etienne Brule. Etienne Brule in the, that movie. Um, he comes to us today from Warren, Michigan. He will be presenting stories, songs, and dances of the Voyager. Please welcome to know Winter Elk Picor. I always like to play something for the people that lived here a thousand years ago. <laughs> That's very pretty. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Jeanneau Picor, and thank you very much for having me uh, present to you today. I don't know if you know this or not, but do you know your Native American, do you know your Native American hand talking sign, Ottawa? Mm -hmm. Hold your arms up like this. This is how you sign Ottawa. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, this is how I sign Michigan. <laughs> That's where I'm from. Uh, you know, originally my people were from, uh, were from Quebec. Story goes we were kicked out of Canada. No surprise there if you knew my family. Uh, the story was is that we renounced our allegiance to the British crown because they wouldn't honor equal rights for native people or mixed bloods. When I perform for the daughters of the American Revolution, I say we renounced our allegiance. They, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's just be, let's begin here with um, the first Frenchman to have been reported to um, explore this region of Lake Erie was Etienne Brule, who I've, I've uh, portrayed in the past. He uh, came to Nouvelle France with, Nouvelle -France with uh, Samuel de Champlain, Champlain in English. And you know, uh, they said Ohio as Loyo. And you can find it if you go back and look. Uh, it's, it's called, um, you see, the Baleen Map of the Great Lakes, 1757. And if you look in the, the lower right hand corner, you will see Loyo which is the uh, Ohio Valley. And we see that uh, he, was, he came as far as the Toussaint River, that means All Saints in French, November 1st. That's why it's named Toussaint on All Saint, for uh, All Saints Day. The French Canadian trappers uh, would not settle in this region though until 1814, you probably know that. Uh, Brulé is said to have seen at least four of the five Great Lakes. And let's move on here. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time lecturing. This is the Baleen map. And you see that if you were here in Montreal, in French Montréal, hmm, you take the French River, the Ottawa River, to the French River through Lake Nipissing. Uh, Mackinac Island was considered the center of the fur trade. 1701, Detroit uh, is founded. But even before that, we have Brulé, and you may have heard of Louis or Louis Joliet in English, in French, Louis Joliet, he accompanied Father Marquette. Uh, he had a brother, Adrien, Adrien Joliet. He was uh, quite an intrepid explorer, uh, but not as well known as his brother. He explored the north shore of Lake Erie to this point, so the story goes, to Long Point, which is right here in Lake Erie. And then soon thereafter, two Sulpician priests from the settlement in Detroit in 1701 then explored more of Lake Erie in hopes of bringing the Catholic Church to the region. Erie, 
uh, I, I won't even know how, uh, I'll try to pronounce it. Ariel Honon, I always do things with a French accent, which is the uh, Iroquoian word for long tail. I don't know if you knew that. And let's see here, so there we go. On to the next slide. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the lifestyle of the voyageurs. Now the voyageurs were the workers of the fur trade. They were not fur traders. They may have eventually become fur traders. You needed a license to trade the furs. But then, of course, not a whole lot of people abided by that <laughs> license because enforcement was either in old France or in Quebec. So the lifestyle of the, for, uh, of the French voyageur has long been romanticized. These men worked hard 12 to 14 hours per day paddle their canoes 45 to 55 strokes per minute. A rest, a rest stop was scheduled every hour to relieve en français fatigué et ennui, which means fatigue and boredom. <laughs> and so distances were measured in pipes. So voyagers would uh, enjoy some time to relax. And a three pipe lake would be 12 to 15 miles in length and was about three hours in travel. And this was traveled before breakfast. And you see down here at the very bottom, uh, the information for this presentation is taken from that, uh, that website. And Lisa, if you want, I can email. Oh, no, I did email this to you. So you've got it for your, your records. And feel free to use it in the future. The voyageur's job was to move furs and supplies from one place to another, either across great distances of water or land. And if you moved the furs and supplies across on land, uh, it was called portage. So the canoe carried 65 bundles of goods to trade as well, uh, and included in there was food for the trip, the voyageur's personal belongings, an ax, a kettle, material to repair the canoe, and the canoe itself weighed 300 pounds, adding to the weight the voyagers carried over the portage. Now in Michigan, if you've ever visited our upper peninsula, this right here, in the language of the people of the three fires, the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi, in their language, Ojibwa, Odawa, Bwadwatomi, Kiwanaw means path made straight by way of a, uh, by way of a portage. So rather than paddle along or around that peninsula, they would put in here, like in Put-In Bay, right? Uh, travel part of the way through um, with the assistance of water and then carry the rest of those items and the canoe until they found a waterway that emptied onto this side of Lake Superior. It was hard work, no question about it. And we'll see just how hard that was. Each bundle weighed uh, 90 pounds. Voyageurs used a trump line to carry the bundles. They wore this leather sling across their forehead. And on top of that bundle, they put another bundle. So you might have to walk like this with about 90 pounds or more on your back for about a half a mile. Herniation was the most prevailing cause of death among the voyageurs. And I, I go into schools and I give this presentation uh, to school children. I also show them the display that I have there. That's just part of what I bring into schools. The furs and the animal tracks. Now the voyageurs, many of them from the old country at least to start until they met Native American women, so how soon after the first Frenchman met the first Native American woman was the first mixed blood child born? Nine months, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so after a while, it was these mixed bloods who were called Métis, or Métis in French, who actually took over the role of, uh, of the voyageurs. So back, uh, neck and back injuries uh, were common. Herniation was a slow and painful death. Drowning was the second most prevailing cause of death. The uh, marchands, the merchants, wanted voyageurs who didn't know how to swim. 
Reason being, they would want to stay in the canoe to save their life rather than jump out of the canoe and risk losing the merchandise. So the story goes in my family that uh, my grandfather from so many generations ago came here to work as an engagé, which is an indentured servant. He would work, or he worked for three years. After three years, uh, assuming he would survive, uh, then he would have a full-time job as a voyager and, and would make money that way. And these are the different uh, sizes of the canoes. The groups of, the, uh, all the canoes together was called a brigade. And we see con uh, the Montreal canoe or the master's canoe. That's the largest. Then we have the north canoe and then an Indian canoe. In the front of the canoe was the avant. Behind was the gouvernier. He was the steersman. And in between, Everybody who sits in there were, were called the milieu. These, these is, uh, this is where the most inexperienced voyagers sat. And let's see here. Uh, we're getting to the fun part. Voyager clothing had to suit their lifestyle. Now, when I left home this morning, we had snow on the ground. It was just a little bit of an ice, icing of snow. Uh, I'd say the closer I got to Toledo, well, I mean, that, that disappeared. So, in Michigan, so the story goes, as in Ohio, I would assume, the weather can change quickly. And we're going to do a story. When the first French came here, they did not speak the language of the people, that is, the indigenous people. So they had to learn hand-talking. Father Marquette an explorer who you may have heard of, wrote in his journal that when he was exploring the Mesopi River, he did not speak their language, and so he had to use hand talking. So put your hands together, just mirror what I'm showing you, and say the story after me. Long, Long. ago, ago. to, to. Spirit. spirit, brothers, ran a race <laughs> when the older brother ran ahead of younger, let me hear you, brother, the skies were good, the sun Shone, and the winds were soft. <laughs> when little brother ran ahead, let me hear you. You never know when you're going to need this. So, ahead of big brother, the skies changed. Snow okay. fell. Rain was cold. And clouds covered the sun. When big brother ran ahead of little brother the skies changed quickly. <laughs> the sun shone, and the winds were soft. Little brother became angry. He ran ahead of big brother, and the skies changed quickly again. Today, when the skies change quickly, this is called 
autumn in Ohio. <laughs> so, when I go into schools, I tell the, uh, the students that the voyageurs had to, they had to adjust to the environment. They had to be aware, or at least have some understanding of the four sisters of survival, water, food, shelter, and warmth. Now think about this. Right around the time of uh, Brule and Joliet, when they visited this part of Ohio, they may have carried one of these. Now in French, I'll teach you some French. Verfu, you try it. <laughs> Fire glass. Oh. Oh. Now every third, I, I do a lot with third grade. Every third grader knows that if you take a magnifying glass outside on a sunny day, hold it up to the sun, let the beam shine on the grass, you can start a fire. Yes, imagine that. At the time of uh, Brule and Joliet right here in Ohio, this was new technology. <laughs> the people of the three fires, the, uh, again, the Ojibwa, Odawa, and Bwadwatomi, they believed you had to, what they called, tickle wood, or in other words, rub wood together. Now, you may have uh, children or grandchildren that know about Minecraft, which is a computer game. <laughs> Minecraft features flint and steel. In French, silex et acite. And I'm going to make a spark with this, but I, of course, I will not make a fire. That spark would fall into gunpowder or oil or a char cloth, something flammable. So think about that. When the French visited here, this was new technology. Now I do have something, I think I, oh, here it is. Our sometimes friends to the east, the Haudenosaunee, people of the Longhouse, you know them as the Iroquois, in French we say Iroquois, they're largely credited with inventing this tool. This is called a pump drill. Now you know that you can start a fire by rubbing wood against wood, mm -hmm. or you could use a bow drill, but this was really an, inv uh, an interesting invention. And let's see here, this is a thermometer, not a taser. <laughs> a lot of kids ask me when I go to school, is that a taser? <laughs> no. So to, to operate this device, and it's also considered the, the uh, grandmother or grandfather of the flywheel, you store energy in the string, wind it up, and with a little bit of force, it operates itself. All you need to do is just push it. So right now the temperature is 73 degrees. Let's see how effective it is. We're not going to make a fire, but the temperature will rise. Don't be surprised if you smell the wood burning. We are now up to 144 degrees. Wow. So you can make a fire with one of these in about four minutes. Oh. I tell children that uh, just because something is old technology doesn't mean it's not good technology. This is still very good technology for making a fire. And we see the voyagers sitting around uh, the fire. They would also need shelter, and you see that the canoe is turned upside down. So when the voyageurs were done for the day, they would pull their canoes out of the water, flip them over, and I think I've got a better, unless I skipped over it, we'll see, I hope I didn't. Hello, where are you? Whoops, maybe I did skip over it. Oh, there we go. You see the canoe has a tarp over it, so they would sleep under the, uh, uh, under the tarp and the canoe with fires uh, outside so they would, um, they would stay warm. I have some good friends in Canada who 
during the summer like to reenact the Voyager lifestyle in Lake Superior. And my good friend John, he was he and the other Voyageurs were reenactors. That's what their camp looked like. So John was saying that uh, he got up in the middle of the night, felt something uh, against his leg. He woke up, looked, and it was a skunk. <laughs> so I said, well, John, what did you do? He said, well, what could I do? You know, the creature wanted a warm, dry place to sleep, and I wasn't going to disturb it. <laughs> so, but in the morning, he got up, the skunk was gone, and uh, who knows, maybe even left a gratuity of some kind. So, so we need, and you know, here we see water, there's food, shelter, and warmth. Now, the warmth was important. The Voyager clothing was important. Let me describe a little bit about what I'm wearing. When I say en français, which means in French, please repeat what I'm saying, and then I'll teach you the name of the piece of clothing. En français? Blouse. Today we say blouse. En français? Pouche de médecine. A medicine pouch, and sometimes voyageurs would carry medicine, uh, let's say maybe the, the bark of the black willow. So they would boil that aspirin, right, to relieve uh, the pain. But today I've got two musical instruments that were the first musical instruments to come to the Great Lakes from across the Atlantic Ocean. Now inevitably there's a student who knows what this is. Now Thursday I was in Sandusky, Michigan, which is in the thumb. All right. In the Huron language, my people are, are allegedly Huron, Sandusky means water. I don't know if you knew that. So let's listen to the guimbard. This is what you call it in French. I call this one little sister. Thank you. And let's listen to Big Brother. Tell me what I'm saying. Oops, sorry. One of the uh, occupational hazards. Take this water? Sure. Thank you. Well, if you were out on the trail, of course you had to find a way to stay warm and dry. So, uh, Paul, would you come up and help me with this, please? <laughs> Does this move? Oh, I guess, geez, I'm going to knock this thing over. Any survivors? Is that the end of the story? <laughs> Sometimes. Yes, sir. All right, so we're going to. Uh, have Paul stand right over here, and we're going to dress him up like a voyageur. Oh. <laughs> the first uh, piece of clothing, and his most important piece of clothing, would be his sash, en français, en français. Ceinture. ceinture. Now, today we see weightlifters with leather belts around their middle to protect their stomach muscles when they're lifting weights. This essentially serve the same purpose, to protect the stomach muscles. And as you saw, the voyageur was, was carrying some heavy loads. And he could earn extra money if he lifted more than his weight. Sometimes when that happened, his stomach muscles ripped and his guts bulged out from herniation. So let's give Paul his ceinture. <laughs> And of course, he would need, uh, en français, en français. Musette, musette, because his 
pantalon. His pants, they didn't have pockets, so all of his personal items would go in here. He might have a scarf and, uh, en français, foulard. foulard. Juke. Juke. Now, I tell children that the Native Americans didn't have sheep and they didn't grow cotton, at least not in this region. So think about that. 300 some years ago, when the French came here, you might say that this was new clothing technology. Native Americans had to make their clothing out of animal skins. And more than any other trade good, it was the French ability to make clothing out of wool or cloth that changed their lives more than any other trade good. 60% of all trades were made for clothing. Now let's say Paul is out on the uh, trail and it's time for soup. And Paul forgot his bowl. He would take his scarf, put it on the inside of his cap, and this is how he would eat his soup. Now the soup was so thick you could take a long-handled spoon, set it in the and the spoon wouldn't fall over. And it had to, the, the spoon had to have lots of calories because he would burn a lot of those calories in working. And inside the musette, he'd always carry en français, Uh, Godet. 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 A dipper. Show us how you'd eat your soup, Paul. <laughs> Bean soup? <Yeah. laughs> Just like that. <laughs> Now, when he was done, he would have to wash the scarf and the cap because he didn't want to smell like uh, food. He might attract a predator. So let's give him his scarf and his toque. <laughs> He would get, en français, français. Grand, grand manteau, a great coat. Grand manteau. Grand manteau. All right. There you go, Paul. Good. It's made out of wool. And we see three and a half lines on the coat. This meant that the coat was worth three and a half beaver pelts. So if he wanted to trade the coat or buy the coat, purchase the coat, he'd have to have at least three and a half beaver pelts or its equivalent. And the coat also has, en français, capuche. Now when I go into schools, I ask the kids, how many of you like to wear hoodies? You know, they all raise their hand. All right, so this is what you say if ever you lose your hoodie. You go up to mama or daddy or grandparents and you say, en français, Uh, Où est ma capuche? Où est ma capuche? That means where is my hoodie? <laughs> Paul would also, Paul would also get, en français, mittens. And what's the word in English? Mittens. Yes, and they're made from the pelt of a beaver, which means that uh, they are water resistant. Yeah. He would get a woolen blanket. Who made it? French or Native Americans? French. French. It was a, uh, a popular trade item. En français? Couverture. And so now we've got Paul. He's nice and warm, but this isn't going to keep him dry, so he would also get en français? Peau d'ours. A bear skin. So let's look at the camera and wave, Paul. <laughs> yeah, we got some. Got another camera back there. Photo opportunity. <laughs> and he would. Were I you going to get? I'm were you going to get a picture? Yeah, don't want to take a picture. I'm oh, losing you're. my caput. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your brother wants to get a picture, Paul. Let's oh. turn this way. <laughs> <laughs> Paul's starting to sweat. Get that picture in here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. At least the one that's stuck. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, thank you, Paul. I'll keep this. Oh, I don't think so. It's going to cost you three and a half beaver pelts. <laughs> okay. 
So when you think about it, the Voyager lifestyle was also a lot about survival. Good job, Paul. <laughs> now, when a, uh, an animal is harvested and its hide is removed on the inside, it has to be scraped. The uh, fat and the, and the blood and so on bef uh, have, has to be scraped before the, uh, the hide is tanned. So think about this. This is an actual, what's called a Celt, a Native American scraper. When the French arrived, they had a tool like this for scraping. And the kids catch on quickly that this is a better tool, not only because it's sharper, it's more durable, but it has a handle. So imagine that, just 300 years ago, you can consider this new technology. All right, we are moving right along here. I am so happy that this thing works. <laughs> All right, so Native American stories were considered exotic. Stories that came from the old country were actually adapted to life in the new world. One such story is La Chasse Galerie. That's about a hunter whose name was Galerie. But this, is, this takes place back in the old country. When, it com when that story comes to the new world, the storytellers then incorporated a canoe. Canoes were not available in old France. So anything that had a cultural product that was Native American that was included in the stories, that was considered exotic. And let's see here. There we go. We are moving just where we are. So we can sing some songs. The idea that the voyagers sang to keep time is incorrect. A lot of people think, well, they, you know, it was their way of keeping, no, no, no. That, the time was set by the, uh, the avant, the person in the front of the canoe. So really, singing the songs was a way to pass the time. Now, they never had an instrument like this, at least not to my knowledge. Oh, I hope it didn't ruin anything. I guess not. You can still hear me, right? Yep. Okay. This is a mandolin. It's related to the violin. So let's sing a canoe song in the style of call and repeat, which is what the, uh, the French voyageurs did. So I'm going to sing a line. You just repeat what I'm singing. You ready? Here we go. I know a man, his name is Jacques. He's got a head as hard as a rock. In French, that's tête jour. You also use it to mean stubborn. He, I heard it inevitably growing up. He, 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 he. He's got a head as hard as a rock. I know a man, his name is Pierre. He got the fleas and lost all his hair. He got the fleas and lost all his hair. I know a girl, her name is Abby. She went to bed late and now she's crabby. <laughs> she went to bed late and now she's crabby. Oh, let's see here. I know a man, his name is Paul. He went skating and had a great fall. He went skating and had a great fall. I know a woman, her name is Myrtle. She's blind as a bat and slow as a turtle. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Let's see here. 
I know a man. Oh, uh, no, I won't do that when we're in polite company. So, <laughs> anybody have a son or grandson named Braden? No? no? I know a boy, his name is Braden. He grew a beard and had to start shaving. Start shaving. Gentlemen, it is your turn to sing. Just the gentleman. It is en français, in French. Watch my mouth and listen for the words. Here we go. Mademoiselle, voulez-vous danser? Mademoiselle, voulez-vous danser? Mademoiselle, voulez-vous danser? Mademoiselle, voulez-vous danser? Yeah, 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 yeah. Ladies, it's your turn. En français, watch my mouth, listen for the words. Oui, monsieur, je voudrais danser. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, gentlemen, you just asked the ladies to dance, and ladies, you just accepted. <laughs> and if you didn't have a fiddle, you know what the next uh, closest dance instrument was? The jaw harp that I played for you. Mm -hmm. Jaw harp in English, guimbard in French. And so the voyageurs could actually dance to somebody playing that instrument. Sure, you uh, put uh, upper lip, lower lip, uh -huh. and it doesn't necessarily have to touch the teeth. In fact, it's probably best that you don't. Um, but if you do, then the top goes against the upper teeth, bottom, the lower teeth, and you change the sound by breathing out or breathing in or changing your, uh, uh, the shape of your mouth. Wow. So, but this was used as a dance instrument. Yeah, Jews harps, even though they have nothing to do with Jewish people. I don't know how it got its name. I thought it was Jews, not Jews. Oh, no, it's, uh, it was J-E-W-S, maybe apostrophe S, Jews harp. These were invented in, uh, scientists believe, in Mongolia or China. They found their way uh, to Europe along the Silk Road. Now, this is, this is over hundreds of years. And then eventually across the Atlantic Ocean, and that little uh, jaw harp had trade value. You could trade 16 for one beaver pelt. Why you would want 16 is beyond me. <laughs> so this, uh, this next tune we see, en roulant ma boule roulant. That means uh, my ball, it rolls along. And it, it, the, the song signifies life, like one day after another. So just to let you hear what it sounds like, En roulant ma boule roulant, en roulant ma boule. Want to try it? Yeah. All right. Two, three, and. En roulant ma boule roulant, en roulant ma boule. En roulant ma boule roulant, en roulant ma boule. Now I'll sing a verse. Derrière chenu est une étang. All together. En roulant ma boule, trois beaux canards sont bon baignant. Roule roulant ma boule. You ready? Boule roulant. Let's do the chorus again. En roulant ma boule roulant. En roulant ma boule. En roulant ma boule roulant. En roulant ma boule. All right, so this, this song is also a story. It goes that behind this man's, uh, behind his, his barn, if you will, back of his property, he has a pond, and there's three beautiful ducks that are swimming. The next verse, Les fils du roi s'en vont chassant. 
Les fils du roi sont bons chassons. All together. En roulant ma boule avec son grand fusil d'argent. En roulant, I'm sorry, roule roulant ma boule roulant. What that means is that the son of the king, he's going, he's hunting, and with his great, his grand fusil, his his uh, uh, carbine hmm, or rifle, which is silver, that's what he's hunting with. So let's do the chorus again. En roulant ma boule roulant, en roulant ma boule, en roulant ma boule roulant, en roulant ma boule. And we see, Vissalana, Vissalanoa, tu es le blanc. En roulant ma boule, au fils du roi, tu es méchant. Roule roulant ma boule roulant. It means that he aims at the black duck but he shoots the white duck. And the farmer says, uh, son of the king, you are so cruel, meaning that he killed his prized duck. There are probably 20 more verses to this song. So yeah, you'd be singing a long time if, uh, if you were in the canoe. So that's an example of an authentic song. Here we see the rendezvous. At the end of the fur trading season, the traders, trappers, and the bourgeoisie, the uh, marchands, the merchants, would gather for uh, an end of the year party. And of course, there was a lot of trading and celebrating going on. The voyageurs, uh, they had, their, in their contracts, was specified when and how much they would be paid. Now, some companies paid their voyageurs three times a year others just two times a year, one at the beginning of the season and then one at the end. The, uh, the voyageurs were famous for taking whatever money they had and just blowing it, <laughs> gambling it away, drinking it away, spending it on loose women, dare I say, <laughs> and they caroused all night long. Now something to, to notice about this is that you see the celebration going on the, uh, going on, on the outside of the Palisades. And you see uh, a home in the background which is lit. That's probably where the, the bourgeois or the marchands were conducting business. But it was rare that the voyageurs would be on the inside of the palisades unless there was some danger. All right? And you know why they kept them on the outside, right? With all that hell raising, who knows what would have happened. The, uh, um, as you see in the picture, dancing was a popular activity. And the only excuse you could have for not dancing was suffering from something called mal de raquette, which means loosely swelling of the feet from wearing snowshoes. <laughs> so the dances were made simple so everyone could participate. Want to learn to dance? <laughs> <clears throat> well, you don't sound very enthusiastic. <laughs> we have mal de raquette. Mm, you have mal de raquette. If you can walk, you can do this. <laughs> now, the music that you're about to hear is from one of my musical groups, Trois Bouffons. Translated, that means three clowns. And if you ever saw us entertain, you'd know why. <laughs> The big group is called La Compagnie Musical Dance Troupe, and we perform throughout, uh, throughout Michigan. We have uh, two fiddlers, an upright bass, somebody who plays penny whistle, squeeze box, and the boron, the Celtic drum. Now, a lot of people will ask, how does a Celtic drum become integrated into French Canadian music? Simple answer. During the uh, French and Indian War, there were many Irish that fought alongside the French. Names like Sullivan were changed to Sylvain. So that's one way that you could have incorporated the Celtic drum into French Canadian music. Another, after the French and Indian Wars ended, the borders opened up and there became, there, uh, resu that resulted in a greater sharing of music and dance. And then you had also, you had people from Nova Scotia, New Scotland, hmm? 
that were migrating westward. So you had this conglomeration of different musical styles, which also impacted the dance steps. Now let me demonstrate for you the song that we're about to hear, the tune rather. It's called, in French, Joie de Québec. In English, Joys of Quebec. How did it get its name? Well, that's interesting. You're probably thinking that. If you were coming from the old country, it would take you six weeks to cross the Atlantic Ocean. All right? When you got off the boat, you really had to find a way to, to scrape out your own survival. It was tough. We had some people from the old country, from France, come to the New World who thought that people were going to wait on them. That didn't happen. <laughs> Especially during the winters in Quebec and Montreal, uh, the weather was brutal. And many people died of, of starvation and, and, uh, and the elements and so on. So some of these people who couldn't take the lifestyle got on the first boat back to the old country. So the way I see it, Anywhere you went, if you were coming or going in Quebec, it was a happy place, <laughs> right? So, to dance this particular dance, it's just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and turn. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and turn. One, <laughs> two, three, four, five, six, seven, and turn. One, two, three, four four, five, six, seven, and stop. Now you would clap three times, step in place three times, one, two, three, put your hands down, <laughs> clap again, one, two, three, step again, one, two, three, and <laughs> Now my people, so the story goes, are from Wendaki, Quebec, that's Huron land. Many people don't realize, but the word Huron is a French word. I'll teach it to you. Make your hand like this, put it on your head, repeat after me. Huron. Huron. Translated, it means spiky-haired, rough person. <laughs> the people that lived in Michigan, the first people had a name for the French. They called them Wemetogoge. You try it. It means hairy face. So anyway, we were... We were doing this dance in a circle, and my Huron brother Darcy came up and said, oh, you know, where did you learn that? I said, oh, God, I've, I've known that one for years. He said, well, that's a lot like our friendship dance, the Huron friendship dance. There was cultural sharing not only uh, among, like, uh, how do I say, the people from the old country with the people from the new country, but there was also cultural sharing among the indigenous people and the French. So when you do this in the circle, in a circle dance, in some ways that replicates the Huron friendship dance. But today we're going to do it in a line. So if you want to learn this dance, and I sure hope we get some volunteers, let's come on over here on this side of the room and line up next to me. Come and join. Bienvenue tout le monde. It means everyone is welcome. Line up next to you. Line up next to me. And you're facing this way. You're facing uh, the camera back there in the corner. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh, this is great. We got lots of, uh, lots of dancers. And yeah, let's move down this way to accommodate them. Now, here's what we're going to do. To teach you, I'm going to be standing in front. When the music starts, I'm going to be at the end of the line, so we'll see how much you remember. <laughs> it's easy. Let's face this way. We take eight small steps. Watch me. It's just one. doesn't matter what, what foot you start on. So you ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and turn. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and turn, and one, and two, and three, and four, and five, and seven, and turn, and one, and two, and three, and four, five, and six, and seven, and stop. Now you face the camera. You're going to clap three times. 
step in place three times. Put your hands down, shake them. Ooh. <laughs> Clap again. Step again. And ooh. Now just a quick story before we start the dance. When my relatives would, would come over and uh, we'd have a good old time, that uh, En Roulant, Ma Boule Roulant, that's also a drinking song. We sang that at my first communion. <laughs> then the adults showed up. <laughs> so it was always a lively time, and my parents would actually move the furniture uh, out of the front room and the dining room so we would have enough room to dance. Then we were lucky enough to get a house with a basement. So you know, the earth was our oyster at that point. All right, are you ready, dancers? And what you're about to hear, this is uh, Les, uh, Les Trois Bouffons, The Three Clowns. And let's hope that uh, this boots up. We are in good shape. All right, are you ready? It's seven and turn and. So it's really eight that and turn and is the eighth step. Go! One, two, three, four, five. And turn. You can clap along. And turn. Yay! Beautiful. Outstanding. Face front. One. Two, three. One, two, three. Ooh, almost like the wave. One, two, three. One, two, three. Ooh, lap a tail. Yee And turn. And turn. One, two, three, step. One, two, three, and ooh. And ooh. One more time. Here we go. Please take a load off. That was wonderful. Oh, thank you. Um, do you have any questions? Do we, or do we have time for questions? Yes, ma'am? Um, I do a lot of cooking, and I've heard the word couvacheur um, in cooking, so sometimes I think that's referred to as like a cover. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. or yes. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an all-purpose. Oh, sure. Yeah. Like uh, my last name, Picar, I mean, and, and words change, especially in, well, in all languages. But uh, my last name used to be P-I-Q-U-E-U-R. In the old country, that, uh, that name means jackhammer. Uh, 300 years ago, there was no such thing. So he was uh, the Picar, and the, uh, the old country was the person who worked in the logging camp and used that H-shaped pike to maneuver the logs. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was up in uh, Niagara on the Lake a few years ago, and in their museum they had a whole section on Etienne Brule. Oh, did they? I was uh, I was in Niagara on the Lake this summer. I, I didn't know that. I'll have to check. Supposedly, in our uh, in our lineage, our family lineage, there's a Brule, which really wouldn't surprise me because uh, one of the reasons why Etienne Brule was killed was that he wasn't. Uh, 
how do I say, he produced a lot of children with a lot of different women, <laughs> and he didn't really have much of an allegiance as time went on except to himself. So, but he was quite an intrepid uh, explorer given his age. Anyone else? Thank you so much for inviting me to be with you today. Je m'appelle Jeannot Picard. Thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome.